Hello, thank you for tuning in to my presentation. My title is a bit of a mouthful. What I'm going to do today is present novel statistical methods that I developed with my collaborators listed here to help us quantify how much we know and how much we can confidently say about how plant-insect interactions have changed throughout deep time. So to begin, I'm just gonna talk briefly about why plant-insect interactions matter. When we look outside today, we see all sorts of fascinating plant morphologies, such as this beautiful purple flower, that only makes sense when we consider how these plants interact with insects. And then in addition to flowers, there are all sorts of other morphologies that we see because of insects, such as the spines that defend this plant against caterpillars. So we can't understand plant evolution until we understand how plants have evolved in response to their interactions with insects. And these plant-insect interactions have very broad implications. To make a long story short, in order to understand plant diversity, we must understand the selective pressures that insects exert on plants. And so that raises the question of how do we measure changes in plant-insect interactions in deep time if we want to see how these interactions change in response to climate change, mass extinction, things like that. And going back to the 1800s, paleobotanists would occasionally remark in their papers on holes that they found that insects had chewed in leaves. And you can think of this as the my favorite bite mark on my favorite leaf approach. I say this because data were not collected systematically. So there was no rigorous way to make comparisons. For example, if you wanted to compare the insect bite marks on Jurassic leaves to the insect bite marks on Cretaceous leaves. Then a little more than 10 years ago, the lovingly named Guide to Insect and Other Damage Types on Compressed Plant Fossils was published. And here you can see an excerpt from this document. So as you can see, there are hundreds of unique numbers and there's one number for each particular type of damage that insects can cause on a leaf that can then be preserved in the fossil record. And so these hundreds of numbers provide a framework that allows us to quantify how the diversity of insect feeding damage on plants has changed in deep time. So we can look at how insect feeding changes during extinctions, during climate change, during rain shifts, during the radiation of new plant groups such as angiosperms. And so the damage guide really was a breakthrough in terrestrial paleoecology, but there's still a number of outstanding questions that are kind of quantitative or statistical questions. So the first of these is how do you know when you've looked at enough leaves? There are some localities with fewer than 50 fossilized leaves that you can examine for insect damage. Is that enough? On the other hand, if you have 5,000 leaves available from a locality, do you need to look at all 5,000 of those fossil leaves in order to be confident in your conclusions about insect feeding damage? Or is there a lower number that you can stop at? Can you stop at 500 leaves or 1,000 leaves? You get the idea. And then also there's the question of how do you standardize for sampling effort when you're comparing different fossil localities or different fossil plant species. So let's say you've examined insect damage on leaves from two localities that you want to compare. If you have 5,000 leaves from the first locality, but you're only able to look at 50 leaves from the second locality, can you make any meaningful comparisons? And if you want to standardize for your sampling effort, should you subsample your larger localities down to a set number of leaves or to a set amount of leaf surface area? And so to go after these questions, we analyzed data that had previously been published in these three papers. And so all of the data that we have are from the Permian of Texas. And in each of these three data sets from each of these localities, we have the damage type diversity that we measured using the guide that I showed a few slides back. And we also calculated the total amount of leaf surface area that we examined, as well as the percentage of that leaf surface area that had been eaten by insects. So getting to that first question, how many leaves do you need? If you look at these three plots, each of the panels represents a different fossil plant species, 
Along the x-axis, we have the number of specimens sampled, and these are ordered by surface area because a lot of these fossils are fragmentary, and so we wanted to start with the most complete fossils. And then along the y-axis, we have the damage type diversity. And so I'll just briefly walk through each of these one by one. When we look at this first species, when we looked at less than 250 specimens, we already have as much damage type diversity as we'll see when we look at every single fossil from this locality belonging to this species. And in addition to seeing every damage type that we're going to see, the width of the confidence intervals that are shaded here in this light green, the width does not change as we go from fewer than 250 species to over 400, or not species, specimens, sorry about that. And so here I've marked um, when we get to specimens that are less than 10 centimeters, five centimeters, two centimeters, and one centimeter, because there's also this question of how small of fragments should you be examining when you are looking for insect damage on plants. And so now in this middle panel, we're looking at a different species here that at this locality, this actually isn't a species, it's a genus, and it's a form genus that is known to be polyphyletic. And so here we do not see the total amount of damage type diversity stabilize as we look at smaller and smaller specimens, and we have more and more specimens in our data set. But the total damage type diversity doesn't really go up too much once we're past 200 specimens, and the width of the confidence interval does remain the same. But again, because this is a polyphyletic plant host, we do see more and more damage types as we look at more and more specimens that are smaller and smaller. And then lastly, here for this last species, we see something very similar, where as we, you know, once we're past 250 specimens, the amount of damage type diversity total barely goes up and the width of the confidence intervals does not change. So we can say that here we've, we've looked at enough leaves. And so the graphs that I've shown you right now are for damage type diversity, but we can also make the same kinds of graphs for the herbivory index. And the herbivory index is simply the percentage of leaf area that has been removed. And so once again, as we saw before, once we're past, you know, 200, 250 leaves in all three of these cases, the mean value for the herbivory index doesn't really change and the confidence intervals, their, their width is pretty constant as well. So another thing that we can look at when we're trying to evaluate whether we have examined a high enough number of leaves is we can use non-metric multidimensional scaling. And so what non-metric multidimensional scaling or NMDS does is it treats every single broad category of insect feeding as a dimension and then it it decomposes that into only two dimensions so we can visualize how the patterns of insect feeding diversity can be compared on different plants or from different plant localities in the fossil record. And so here, what we've done is we have subsampled um, from four different fossil plant species, each is represented with its own color, and we've subsampled down to 250 square centimeters of surface area, and we've done this subsampling procedure 500 times. So each of these points represents one iteration for one plant species. And then we have these confidence ellipses, and when they overlap, well, in that case, it appears that the insect feeding damage that we see on the different plant hosts is somewhat similar. It's not separate, so it's not distinct. And so what we can do is we can increase the amount of surface area that we examine that we're subsampling to in our NMDS plots. So when we double that, when we examine 500 square centimeters instead of 250 square centimeters, all of a sudden we see separation. Right? So previously at only 250 square centimeters, each plant host overlapped with at least one other plant host, but here the ellipses are much smaller and there's much less overlap. And then when we go from 500 to 750 square centimeters, the confidence ellipses do become noticeably smaller in most cases. And then when we go to 1,000 square centimeters, again, we in three of the four cases for three of the four plants, we have even smaller confidence ellipses. But they're not getting very much smaller which means that we're, in a sense, getting less and less of a return for each additional leaf that we sample. And so we can calculate these metrics of insect herbivory as we go when we sample more and more leaves and use that to try and see 
when these metrics no longer change, that's when you can say that you have looked at enough leaves for your study. And so now I'll switch gears a little bit to the question of sampling standardization. Right, so if you have a number of localities and at each one you have a different number of leaves and a different amount of leaf surface area, how do you standardize for that to make robust comparisons of insect feeding? And so here we have the number of specimens sampled along the x-axis and the number of damage types that we see along the y-axis, just as was the case before, and this is a rarefaction curve. So as we sample more and more plant specimens, how many more damage types do we see? And on the left, this is just by the number of specimens, but on the right, instead we have scaled these rarefaction curves so that they reflect the amount of surface area that's been sampled. And as you can see, the result that we get changes really dramatically when we account for the fact that one of these localities has much larger leaves than the other. So we need to take leaf surface area in mind and scale our rarefaction curves accordingly in order to compare patterns of insect feeding. And this is just to show you that this is not only the case for entire fossil plant localities, but also for individual fossilized plant taxa. So you can see here again, we're going from specimen sampled on the x-axis on the left to the amount of surface area sampled on the x-axis on the right. And the emergent pattern that we see really does change when we scale by the amount of surface area that we've looked at. So in conclusion, it's best to calculate your metrics of insect herbivory as you collect your data, and then your sampling is complete when these metrics stabilize. And rarefaction curves should be scaled by the amount of surface area examined, not by the number of leaves. And with that, I'd like to thank Bill DeMichael, Kevin Boyce, and John Payne for their help on this project, as well as our funding sources. And thank you so much for tuning in.